just a couple of seconds and it should be good. All right, then shall we get started? Yes. Oh, okay. Then uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to a new term with the Oxford University Strategic Studies Group. I'm Giuseppe, the, the vice president, and together with our president, Anna, and the entire committee, I'm very happy to start our series of events for Mikomas term 2021. As you may have heard uh, this term, we are actually implementing a hybrid term card with four in-person events, three online events, and a social event uh, next Tuesday at the Oxford Retreat, which we hope to see many of you there. Uh, but now let me start by introducing our, our first speaker, uh, and what a speaker actually. We have with us directly from Stanford in California, uh, where it's morning, we have General Herbert Raymond McMaster, who is Fuad Mijello Jami, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford. And he also, you may know General McMaster for being the 26th assistant to the US president for national security affairs. He will speak to us on the topic of the catastrophe in Afghanistan, competition with China, and the need to rebuild strategic competence. It's a very loaded title with a lot of information there, so I need to go quickly over uh, General McMaster's bio before giving me the floor, giving him the floor. So uh, upon graduation from the United States Military Academy in 1984, General McMaster served as commissioned officer in the US Army for 34 years before retiring as a Lieutenant General in June 2018. From 2014 to 2017, McMaster designed the future Army as the Director of the Army Capabilities Integration Center and the Deputy Commanding General of the US Army Training and Doctrine Command. As Commanding General of the Maneuver Center of Excellence at Fort Benning, he oversaw all training and education for the Army's infantry, armor, and cavalry forces. He has extensive experience leading soldiers and organizations in wartime in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Operation Desert Storm. McMaster also served as overseas advisor to the most senior commanders in the Middle East, Iraq, and Afghanistan. In addition to his extensive military experience, General McMaster also holds a PhD in military history from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He is the author of a number of important books and articles, including the award-winning book, Dereliction of Duty, Lyndon Johnson, Robert McManamara, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the lies that led to Vietnam. He is also the author of the most recent, more recent Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World, which just recently went to press. He was a contributing editor for Survival, Global Politics and Strategy from 2010 to 2017. His many essays, articles, and books reviews on leadership, history, and the future of warfare have appeared in The Atlantic, Foreign Affairs, Survival, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. So let me conclude by mentioning his social media handles. Uh, General McMaster is active on Twitter and Instagram at uh, LTGHR McMaster, so make sure to follow him. And he also runs a podcast, Battlegrounds, like the book, but subtitle International Perspectives on Crucial Challenges to Security and Prosperity, which I, re which I highly recommend because it's really interesting and very engaging. So there's a lot there in terms of military experience, obviously political experience and academic experience. And there is a very important topic to talk and to discuss today. So without further ado, I yield the floor to General McMaster. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. And thanks to you and Anna and to the Oxford University Strategic Studies Group for the privilege of being with you. I regret that I'm unable to be there in person and to enjoy a pint afterward with you, at maybe at the Royal Blenheim and discuss really important topics like rugby union and, you know, for example, the recent upset of the All Blacks by the Springboks. <laughs> um, Hey, in, the, in the conclusion of Battlegrounds, I, I quote an historian of technology, Elting Morrison, who wrote in the 1960s that to live safely in our society, let alone manage it, will require continuous education until a person dies. And so I applaud what, the, what your strategic studies group is doing and has done over many years to discuss issues important to advancing peace and building a better future. You know, emerging stronger from the traumas of recent years requires a focus on education. Of course, those traumas include a pandemic, 
a recession. In the United States, you have social divisions that were laid bare by George Floyd's murder and the violent aftermath. And in the United States, not only in the United States, but I think really almost in every Western country who has had elections and or has elections coming up, really vitriolic partisan political divisions. And I think the combination of all of this has reduced confidence in our democratic institutions and processes. And now, of course, we're witnessing the humanitarian, the political and security crises that are really just now beginning as a result of what I would describe as self-defeat in Afghanistan. General, so, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you at this fine prologue. We, we just can't see you. We can hear you perfectly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, which is fine. We'll, the, the no, I just don't know, what, I don't know what's happening. I didn't, I didn't really touch anything. Let me see if... Uh, it's all know, right if you... It's, it's not maybe a huge loss if you can't see me, but hold on. I don't know why it wouldn't be working. Let me see now. Are you looking at... We can go see... Go to video it. settings. Exactly. So strange. It's okay if it doesn't work. Well, we can hear you perfectly. No, but I have my ca my camera was working before, right? Yes, I mean, so that's I, true. I can guarantee I saw so, you. <laughs> uh, okay, let me see. Let me try this. Yes. How about now? Does Perfect. that work? Yes, go ahead. Gosh, now we I don't have know what's evidence happening. that the person who's talking is General McMaster. <laughs> go ahead. So, so really, I, what I'd like to talk with you about is is how we can regain our confidence, our, our confidence that seems to be lacking based on these traumas. But, but of course, to do that, I think first we have to improve our competence. And the catastrophe that we're witnessing in Afghanistan, I believe, is the result of incompetence incompetence based in strategic narcissism or the propensity to define the world only in relation to us and to assume that what we decide to do is decisive in securing a positive outcome. The problem with that tendency is that it does not acknowledge the agency, influence, and authorship over the future that others enjoy, especially enemies, adversaries, and, and rivals. In Afghanistan, a lack of what the historian Zachary Shore calls strategic empathy resulted in policies and strategies across two decades that were based on what the purveyor preferred rather than what the situation demanded. Strategic narcissism led to self-delusion, and self-delusion provided a rationale for self-defeat. So what we might learn from the what might we learn from the, the lost war in Afghanistan? so we can begin to rebuild strategic competence. I think we might first relearn that war and competition short of war are interactive and that progress in war or diplomacy is never linear. The war in Afghanistan and the long war against jihadist terrorist organizations is not over. It is just entering a new era. But learning from our self-defeat in Afghanistan, recovering from that catastrophe, rebuilding confidence, co competence will require our leaders first, I think, to stop pretending. Stop pretending that our surrender to the Taliban in February 2020 and subsequent concessions to that terrorist organization, which strengthened our enemies and weakened our Afghan allies, were not the principal causes of a lost war and its consequences. The psychological blows we delivered to our Afghan allies included negotiating with the Taliban without the Afghan government, not insisting on a ceasefire, forcing the Afghan government to release 5,000 terrorists, curtailing intelligence support, ending active pursuit of the Taliban, withdrawing all aircraft from the country, and terminating contractor support uh, for the Afghan armed forces, which were bearing the brunt of the fight uh, against, uh, against the Taliban. Stop pretending that we can end so-called endless wars by withdrawal. Wars do not end when one party disengages and our enemies are waging an endless jihad. We failed to learn from the complete withdrawal from Iraq in December 2011 and the subsequent reemergence of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which then morphed into ISIS. By the summer of 2014, remember ISIS had gained control of territory the size of Britain and became the most destructive terrorist organization in history. 
As the English philosopher and theologian G.K. Chesterton observed, war may not be the best way of settling differences, but it may be the only way to ensure that they are not settled for you. Stop pretending that all our efforts in Afghanistan were wasted. Progress is impossible to disavow as we watch the Taliban reverse gains and reinstate the horrors endured during the organization's rule from 1996 to 2001. Afghanistan was not transformed into Denmark, but Afghanistan only needed to be Afghanistan, with a government hostile to jihadist terrorists and security forces strong enough, with international support, to withstand the regenerative capacity of the Taliban. Stop pretending that the outcome would have been better if we had simply left Afghanistan after the successful military campaign in 2001. The consolidation of gains has never been an optional phase in war. The notion that the Taliban would have accepted a negotiated agreement consistent with our objectives in Afghanistan earlier in the war is just another element of our self-delusion. Stop pretending that America cannot generate the will for sustained military efforts abroad. Sustained efforts in Korea, the Sinai, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Colombia are just a few examples of successful and sustained long-term efforts in support of local partners. Those who cite public opinion polls that favor withdrawal all in the United States should attribute lack of support to leaders' failure to explain what was at stake in the war and the strategy for achieving an outcome worthy of the costs, risks, and sacrifices. By 2018, very low levels of multinational military and financial support were enabling the Afghans to bear the brunt of the fight. Stop pretending that there are short-term solutions to long-term problems. Afghanistan was not a 20-year war. It was a one-year war fought 20 times over. Our short-term approach increased the cost and duration of the war. Declarations of withdrawal across three administrations emboldened our enemies, sowed doubts among our allies, encouraged hedging behavior, perpetuated corruption, and weakened state institutions. Stop pretending that adversaries will conform to our preferences or that we can fight enemies that we wish we had rather than our actual enemies. Until the base motivation of its army changes, Pakistan will not be a partner against terrorist organizations. The Taliban has not changed, is intertwined with other jihadist terrorists, and is determined to reinstate brutal Sharia. The reestablishment of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan is as much a victory for al-Qaeda and other jihadists as it is for the Taliban. The notion of partnering with the Taliban to fight terrorism is like partnering with Tony Soprano to fight organized crime. Stop pretending that vilification from the international community will influence the Taliban. The notion that enemies of humanity who are determined to force Afghanistan back into the 7th century, or an organization led by uh, Hebatola Akinzada, who encouraged his 17-year-old son to commit murder as a suicide bomber at age 17, are concerned about chiding tweets or disapproving speeches is ludicrous. Stop pretending that the military instrument can be separated from diplomacy. As the late Secretary George Schultz observed, Negotiation is a euphemism for capitulation unless the shadow of power is cast across the bargaining table. Civilian and military leaders said that there was no military solution to the war in Afghanistan, but the Taliban, their Pakistani sponsors, and their al-Qaeda allies clearly came up with one. More diplomacy with the Taliban without the prospect of force will achieve nothing but further embarrassment. Finally, we must stop pretending that is it, is it acceptable to fight wars without a commitment to win. Winning in Afghanistan meant achieving the just intention of ensuring that Afghanistan never again became a haven for jihadist terrorists. Because in war, each side tries to outdo the other, a lack of commitment to win is counterproductive. 
And according to Thomas Aquinas' Jus ad bellum theory, it is also unethical to fight without determination to succeed. Our leaders invented new terms like responsible end as a cover for their ambivalence as they sent soldiers into battle. Unless we stop pretending and demand better from our leaders, the prospect of learning from our searing experience in South Asia, rebuilding our strategic competence, and effacing the stain of 2021 will remain dim. So it's urgent that we stop pretending, regain our strategic competence, and rebuild the confidence necessary to compete against rivals, adversaries, and enemies. And, and I think the stakes are high. The stakes are high as the Chinese Communist Party or CCP races to perfect its technologically enabled police state and export its authoritarian mercantilist model. Other examples include obviously Vladimir Putin's Kremlin as it continues to direct a sustained campaign of political subversion against Europe and the United States while using military forces to intimidate countries on Russia's frontier and using its energy exports for coercive purposes. Chairman Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party leaders believe that they have a narrow window of opportunity to strengthen their rule and revise the international order in their favor before China's economy sours, before the population grows old, and before events expose vulnerabilities the party created in their rush to surpass the United States uh, and the free world and realize the China dream. The CCP is obsessed with control because it is afraid of losing its exclusive grip on power. The party's fears and ambitions are inseparable. The narrative of regaining honor lost during the century of humiliation and taking center stage in the world is meant to promote the China model of one-party authoritarian rule and portray that model as superior. Chinese Communist Party fear and ambition drive strategies designed to maintain control and gain economic and strategic advantage. They have names like military civil, civilian fusion, made in China 2025, and one belt, one road. The goals are to establish Chinese hegemony, create exclusionary areas of primacy across the Indo-Pacific region, achieve preponderant advantage in advanced manufacturing and in the emerging data-driven global economy, dominate global logistics and communications infrastructure, and rewrite the rules of international trade and political discourse. Across all those strategies, the CCP employs what we might call the three C's, a combination of co-option, coercion, and concealment. China co-ops countries, international corporations, academics, and elites you know, through false promises of impending liberalization, insincere pledges to work on global issues, and especially the lure of short-term profits and access to the Chinese market, investments, and loans. Co-option includes debt traps set for corrupt or weak governments. Co-option makes countries and corporations dependent and vulnerable to coercion. The party coerces others to turn a blind eye to its most egregious human rights abuses and support its foreign policy. It applies co-option and coercion to subvert international organizations. The party's success depends on concealing its intentions and portraying its most egregious actions as normal practice. Free trade, Xi Jinping, Signs, dra signs a draft comprehensive agreement on investment with Europe while punishing Australia economically and, and shutting down market share for retailers who object to slave labor. Environmentalist Xi Jinping promises carbon neutrality by 2060 while China finances and builds scores of coal-fired power plants internationally every year. Human rights Xi Jinping gives speeches on rule of law while he interns millions in concentration camps, extends the party's repressive arm into Hong Kong, imprisons journalists and freedom activists, and holds hostages. Compassionate Xi Jinping speaks of a community of common destiny and peace, concord, and harmony, and asserts that the Chinese nation does not carry aggressive or hegemonic traits in its genes. 
while his government subverts international organizations. His army bludgeons Indian soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier. His cyber forces continue a massive campaign of espionage. Force menaces Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan, and his Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine uh, and Maritime militias exert ownership over the ocean in the South China Sea. Competing effectively with the CCP requires countering Xi's Orwellian re reversal of the truth by correcting two misunderstandings that provide cover for the party and conceal what is at stake in its campaign of co-option and coercion. Both misunderstandings are rooted in the conceit that the CCP mainly responds to external actions rather than pursues its own ambitions. The first misunderstanding is that Chinese aggression is the result of U.S.-China tensions. A survey of the CCP's recent actions reveals that the United States did not cause CCP aggression and that China's promotion of its model poses the real threat to security and prosperity. In addition to the military aggression I mentioned, uh, the CCP suppressed information about the COVID-19 outbreak, persecuted doctors and journalists who tried to warn the world and subverted and continues to subvert the World Health Organization. The CCP added insult to injury with so-called wolf warrior diplomacy. To kill one to warn 100, China inflicted economic punishment on Australia as Chinese hackers conducted massive cyber attacks on medical research facilities around the world. Meanwhile, the CCP used the pandemic to advance its technologically enabled Orwellian police state, extend its repression into Hong Kong, and continue slow genocide in Xinjiang. But some continue to apologize for the Chinese Communist Party, blame the United States, and call for more engagement with China as an end in itself. Some of America's closest friends proclaim that they don't want to choose between Washington and Beijing. But the actual choice that those nations face is not one between Washington and Beijing. It is a choice between sovereignty and servitude. A second misunderstanding gained wide acceptance in early 2017, as some policy experts argued that the competition with China is dangerous or even irresponsible because of a Thucydides trap, a term coined to express the likelihood of conflict between a rising power, China, and a status quo power, the United States. CCP leaders love the, the, the Thucydides trap trope because it allows the party uh, to, to escape responsibility and promotes a false dilemma between passive accommodation or war. But transparent competition is the best way to prevent unnecessary escalation and enable rather than foreclose on cooperation with China. It is important to correct these two misunderstandings because they provide cover for the party's aggression and a rationalization for those eager to shrink from competition. For example, some investors continue to pour money into Chinese stocks and bonds, undaunted by the CCP's increasing intervention in the private sector. As China surpassed the United States as the top destination for new foreign direct investment in 2021, one could imagine Chinese Communist Party leaders evoking the quotation erroneously attributed to Vladimir Lenin. The capitalists will sell us the rope with which we will hang them. Except it's even worse. We are actually financing the CCP's purchase of the rope. Nations and corporations should take something like a Hippocratic Oath for doing business or in or investing in China. Free world political, corporate, and financial leaders should vow to cause no harm or hurt in three ways. First, do not transfer uh, technology, sensitive technology, that gives the Chinese Communist Party military advantage or unfair economic advantage. Second, do not help the CCP stifle human freedom and perfect its police state. And third, do not compromise the long-term viability of companies in exchange for short-term profits. The United States and, and allies must also strengthen military capabilities to, to, to deter confrontation with the PLA, uh, the People's Liberation Army. De deterring conflict requires, of course, greater investments in defense modernization, readiness, and force structure. 
China is engaged in the largest peacetime military buildup since the 1930s and is on track for surpassing the U.S. military's annual procurement value well before 2030. Deterring CCP aggression also requires a combination of strong defense partnerships and alliances, as well as capable forward-positioned American forces of sufficient size to convince Chinese leaders that they cannot accomplish their objectives through the use of force. This is why I think the, the new the new AUKUS arrangement uh, alliance is, is important and, and relevant to meeting the challenge of, of ensuring deterrence by denial uh, of the People's Liberation Army. Also important, those fostering improvements in Japan's and Taiwan's defense capabilities, as, as well as NATO's defense capabilities. Uh, and, and I think the, the, you know, the priority of doing so uh, has, been, has been really brought to the fore, uh, given, uh, given the, uh, the recent menacing encroachments on Taiwan's air defense identification zone by, by scores of People's Liberation Army Air Force aircraft. But the greatest opportunity to defend against China, and, and Russia as well, uh, may lie in just strengthening democratic governance, rule of law, and freedom of expression at home and, and abroad. The freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and rule of law helps expose malign Chinese and Russian influence, for that matter, and prosecute those who enable it. That is why support for democratic institutions and processes and the unalienable rights that, that, that should be afforded to all peoples is not just an exercise in altruism. It is also a practical means of countering the CCP's campaign of co-option, coercion, and concealment. And, and also, and also uh, countering Russia's you know, new generation warfare or sustained campaign of politi political subversion using cyber-enabled information warfare against us. We should be confident. I mean, democracy is actually resilient while authoritarian and totalitarian dictatorships are, are brittle. And the traumas that we're experiencing today across the free world are not unprecedented. We might recall that in the 1970s, the United States and NATO appeared weak. Americans were deeply divided over race and an unpopular war. The Watergate scandal and the cover-up of that scandal led to President Richard Nixon's resignation. Other events shook America's confidence, such as the Vietnamese communist assault on Saigon and, and the desperate evacuation of the American embassy there in April of 1975. Stagflation and oil crises added economic traumas. The decade ended with an Iranian revolution, a failed hostage rescue attempt, and a and a 444 day long hostage crisis. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union appeared strong. Like Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, Soviet leaders saw America's tolerance for civil and political liberties as a vulnerability. But the struggles of the 1970s belied American. And, and the free world's strengths. We might look back to the speech that President Ronald Reagan delivered at the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin on June 12, 1987. Today, leaders across the free world have an opportunity to clarify with exhortations like Reagan's, tear down this wall, what is at stake in the competition with the CCP and, and the Kremlin? The Berlin Wall is an apt analogy for both Putin's and Xi Jinping's persecution of journalists. It's also an apt analogy, I think, for the Great Firewall of China, because they are all efforts to isolate the realm of authoritarian regimes from outside influences. If Chairman Xi and President Putin are confident in their systems, then they should, they should welcome uh, open competition and allow their citizens to access multiple sources of information and, and judge for themselves. And it is important not only to, as Reagan did, explain clearly what is at stake in the competition with authoritarian regimes, but also to restore confidence in our democracies. This is where all of us, where all of you can help. We can empathize with, the, with one another. Today, it seems that those who know the least about issues and who are strangers to their fellow citizens seek affirmation of their biases rather than knowledge. They judge their neighbors rather than try to understand their perspectives. Ignorance drives a destructive interaction between identity politics, vitriolic partisan rhetoric, bigotry, and racism. The manipulation of history remains an important tool, not only for the Chinese Communist Party and the Kremlin, but also 
some of our fellow citizens who prefer to sow division and conflict rather than foster unity and goodwill. Ignorance of history, compounded by the abuse of it, undermines our ability to work together and improve our nations because it saps our pride. As the late philosopher Richard Rorty observed, national pride is to countries what self-respect is to individuals, a necessary condition for self-improvement. Pride should not derive from you know, contri a contrived happy view of history, but rather from a recognition that our experiments in freedom and democracy always were and remain works in progress. But we should recognize that it is an abuse of history. Um, to, as, as the new left historians often do, to attribute causation for all the ills of the world to colonialism or whatever they mean by capitalist imperialism. Their interpretation of history, tainted by a mild form of self-loathing, is profoundly arrogant because it, it assumes that others, including rivals, adversaries, and enemies, have no aspirations or agendas except in response to, to our actions. Other perversions of history are direct assault, assaults on the soul of, of nations. For example, it is now in vogue to teach our children in, in the United States that the American Revolution was an effort to preserve slavery rather than a struggle to gain independence and found our nation on principles that ultimately rendered that horrible institution unsustainable. It is as much an abuse of history as the myth of the lost cause which portrayed the Civil War as a war over states' rights rather than slavery, and portrayed slavery as benign instead of cruel in an effort to justify Jim Crow segregation and institutionalize inequality of opportunity. History untainted by presentist agendas, such as those associated with identity politics, elements of critical race theory, or or various forms of bigotry and racism, should encourage citizens to celebrate principles such as equality of opportunity, equal treatment under the law, and due process of law, freedom of religion, of expression, and the press, and also realize that work remains to realize them. We should be confident because democracy is resilient while communist totalitarianism is brittle. Wang An, who migrated to the United States from China in the 1950s and founded the groundbreaking computer company Wang Laboratories, said of his adopted country, as a nation, we do not always live up to our, our, our ideals, but we have structures that allow us to correct our wrongs by means short of revolution. In contrast, Xi Jinping's speech in July 2021 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the CCP contained a combination of admonishments, warnings, threats, and of course, Lots of obligatory praise for the 95 million member Chinese Communist Party. But she and his friend Vladimir Putin are very much aware of another anniversary this year, the 30th anniversary of Mikhail Gorbachev's resignation and the end of the Soviet Union. Citizens in the United States, the United Kingdom, and across the free world you know, must, must recognize uh, that we have agency. All of us can do our part to restore confidence in democracy. And we can demand competence. We can tell our leaders to stop pretending and talk with our fellow citizens respectfully, not only about the challenges we face, but also how we might work together to build a better future for generations to come. And we might also take a moment to celebrate the freedoms we enjoy today. Thanks for the privilege of being with you, Giuseppe. I look forward to, to where you and Anna would like to take the conversation. Well, thank you so much. Uh... It's a pity that we can't give you an actual round of applause. Uh, that's the privilege of doing it in person. But we will take advantage of this um, virtual meeting in any way to thank you for your talk, which spanned a lot of issues, clearly, from Afghanistan to very recent events to more general, broader, long-term view of American democracy and Western democracy. And uh competition and cooperation among countries um so yes now the part that this conversation will move to a q a session so people who are in the chat 
and I'm going to switch to my toggle tile view are are welcome to raise their hands virtually to pose their question to General McMaster. And there are people who might also uh, ask questions on the chat on YouTube. We will check. So we will start with the first person that I saw um, raising their hand, uh, who is uh, Lydia. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. yes. Hello, thank you very much, Engineer General, for a fantastic lecture. Um, you mentioned China's debt traps and coercion and co-option. I wonder where do you see China's uh, strategic interest in the future of Afghanistan? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Well, you know, I think the, the geostrategic competition never really left Afghanistan. It's certainly broad, more broadly Central and South Asia. Of course, you know how much China has been investing in infrastructure projects, I think, that do aim to create servile relationships with countries in the region so based on indebtedness, the debt trap set for them, and the creation of economic dependencies. We see that really most dramatically in the China-Pakistan economic corridor, the Korakum Highway, the, you know, the, the development of the Port of Gwadar. Uh, I, I think that those interests will extend into Afghanistan. You already have the Chinese sort of accommodating with the Taliban government. Uh, and I think that China and Russia both will attempt to exert their interests there in Afghanistan in a way that uh, that extends their, you know, their strategic influence in the region. Uh, and in, in the case of uh, in the case of China, uh, you know, really weakens Indian influence in the region and, and, and begins to isolate India as a major regional rival. So I, I, there are huge geostrategic implications of the withdrawal. There was this sort of conventional wisdom you know, that we needed to disengage uh, from Afghanistan so that we could we could free up resources for you know for uh, competition with China, uh, as if the competition with China doesn't occur elsewhere in the world, uh, certainly in South Asia, but I, I would say across the greater Middle East as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our Thank next you. question uh, from Talia. Uh, yes, General, thank you very much for a very uh, interesting talk. I am by no means a supporter of the CCCP, but I'm struck by the fact that their argument in response to your points might be that many of the criticisms you've leveled against them are criticisms of things that also have been happening in varying degrees in the West. So, for example, we have seen democratic backsliding throughout COVID uh, in the West. Uh, the highest per capita rate of incarceration isn't in China, it's in the United States. And so what my question is, should not these be our greatest concerns about the issues within our own borders? And should this not be uh, a central topic in our conversations about uh, the increasing influence of China? And surely without which we can't preach democracy to the rest of the world. Well, you know, I, I would just say we have work to do in our democracies, but I just reject the moral equivalence that underpins your, your question. I mean, you know, we, we are not engaged in genocidal campaigns uh, in, in, in the West. I mean, Uyghur birth rates are down 60 percent. There are over a million people in concentration camps. They're using Uyghurs as forced labor so, so, so that they can profit on the, on the backs of really modern day uh, slaves. Uh, you know, so I, I, I just think that the moral equivalence uh, it, argument doesn't doesn't work doesn't mean we don't have work to do in all of our democracies, but we should maybe celebrate the fact that we do have a say in how we're governed. Uh, what if you what if you were to criticize uh, as a Chinese citizen, China in the way that you levied, I mean, I mean uh, well-meaning criticisms about our countries, where would you be? You'd be in prison uh, in, in China now. Um, so I, I just think it's it's important for us to, to, to remain self-critical, but not to buy into the sort of moral equivalence that I think is, is self-defeating uh, and creates these opportunities for the Chinese Communist Party to portray its most egregious behavior and actions, um, you know, as, as normal business and, and as equivalent to what we see in the West. I just think we have to recognize that if China, if China succeeds in promoting its authoritarian mercantilist model, the world will be less free, less prosperous, and less safe. And just look at the countries, right, that, that China has a really close relationship with, especially, you know, in, in the developing world. Uh, you know, it's, it's North Korea. I mean, it's Pakistan. Uh, it's Cambodia. It's Zimbabwe. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's not a cocktail party I want to go to. You know, so I, I just think that I think we, we, we should not suggest an equivalence 
with our relationships with, with countries that, that are based on transparency, that are based, I think, really on mutual benefit, and the servile relationships that, uh, that China um, is developing as it exports its authoritarian, uh, authoritarian model. All right. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, I'm now going to move quickly to the YouTube chat where there are two questions from uh, Andrew Payne, former president of USSG. So he has two questions for the general. First, uh, in what ways did domestic political considerations complicate the ability or the willingness of, of leaders to prosecute a long war approach in Afghanistan? And can these constraints ever be overcome? So that's the first question. The second question is about your personal experience as national security advisor. And it is when advising the president, uh, how, when advising the president, how did the general seek? So you seek to apply the lessons from the dereliction of duty. And were there any parallels you saw in senior military leadership's relationship with President Trump? Yeah. Okay, so so uh, uh, d domestic considerations on Afghanistan, I think, were 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 dominant uh, in connection with the, the to get out and the mantra of ending the endless war, in the belief that this is what the American people wanted. So I think in 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 actually prioritizing the domestic what was were perceived as the domestic political opinion that leaders shirked responsibility and and failed to lead public opinion and explain to the American people. What they needed to know about that sustained commitment in the in, in 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 a long in that long war, which is what is at stake? Why do Americans care? Uh, and then secondly, and what is it? What are the objectives? And what is the strategy that will deliver a favorable outcome at an acceptable cost and risk? And you know, I think the only time that that happened uh, was during, I mean, paradoxically, you know, the the Trump administration in 2017. And so I'll use that as a, as a bridge into, you know, my job as national security advisor. You know, having studied the national security decision-making process from the perspective of a historian, it was kind of surreal, you know, walking into, you know, McGeorge Bundy's office, who was national security advisor during the decisions that led to an American war in Vietnam and recognizing, okay, hey, you know, I'm, I'm now responsible for this process. So I did endeavor to at least not make the same mistakes, right? And, and, and uh, the way that I endeavored to do that was to, 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 to run a process, to run a process that provided the president with best analysis and advice across the departments and agencies and presented the president with multiple options. In Vietnam, what what what, what didn't happen, what should have happened, is, is, to sp is to spend more time thinking about the nature of, of the problem, the nature of the challenge in, in, in Vietnam, really framing, uh, you know, framing the, the nature of the challenge by trying to understand the conflict on its own terms, what was driving the conflict, what was the nature of the enemy, what, what, what was the enemy trying to achieve. Also taking a critical look at the South Vietnamese government and armed forces and understanding that really the dynamics of the conflict on, on its own terms, and then identifying what vital interests were at stake, and then viewing that, that problem set through the lens of vital interests and crafting overarching goals and more specific objectives. But then, of course, doing what was often skipped in Washington. It was skipped during the period uh, during which these decisions were made that led to an American war in Vietnam, which is to identify and make explicit assumptions uh, on, on which uh, on which these options are based, especially those involving uh, the degree to which we and like-minded partners have agency and influence over the problem, uh, and then identifying real obstacles to progress and opportunities that could be exploited. That kind of thinking, uh, that, that clear thinking did, didn't occur in that period. I think it did occur. Uh, when we were trying to give President Trump options on on Afghanistan, now of course all of that was reversible, and I was gone uh, by the time the president reversed it. But I think what was important for us was to insulate that process from domestic political considerations, knowing that there would be those who have the president's ear about dom about domestic political ramifications of his decisions. But then also our our real drive to provide the president with multiple options because it was in the presentation of those multiple options that you could highlight long-term costs and consequences. The first option we briefed him on was the option toward which he was predisposed, which was complete withdrawal from Afghanistan. But in briefing that option and highlighting what we, what we thought would happen, which is exactly what is happening right now, the president said, after having looked over that precipice, said, we don't want to do that. And so he, he, he actually approved... Uh, a strategy that was sustainable, I believe, and, and was working 
Um, it was a, it was based on a long term approach, a, a much lower level of commitment financially and militarily, and a commitment that would enable Afghanistan to harden and strengthen itself over time against the regenerative capacity of the Taliban. It would provide it would it would prioritize diplomatic efforts, not talking to these, pardon the expression, jackasses in in Doha gutter, but instead talking to Afghans about trying to get that helping them to resolve their differences and not be so fractious and and to come together around a common vision for the country it would have it would have focused on institution building not to make again Afghanistan to Denmark but just to help Afghanistan be Afghanistan and to ensure those institutions were strong enough to withstand the, the regenerative capacity of the Taliban it would have focused on sustained international assistance which we had by the way and I think it's worth pointing out that there are that there are you know about twice as many troops from the, the broader coalition and from NATO uh, in Afghanistan that were U.S. troops toward the end of the, end of the conflict. So I, I think that, that that we did put in place an effective uh, an effective process that delivered multiple options that allowed the president to make a good decision. Uh, but um, and that was that was largely based. Those efforts were largely based on what I learned from decision making in the Vietnam period. Well, thank you very much for also providing these uh, insights about the life as a national security advisor, which surely our group treasures. Okay, uh, I did see a hand from uh, Matt, but I don't see it anymore. So, oh, he's still there. So, Matt, would you like to speak? Hi, <coughs> thanks for your talk, General. Um, <coughs> I'm. Uh, I'd just like to um, to ask a question about um, the the. The, the sort of perception in the UK is that the US policy with regards to China is one of uh, the few areas where there's uh, bipart bipartisan agreement on, on the way forward. Is, is that a myth or, or does it reflect your, your experience in, in government? And if so, is that is that an area of uh, a potential optimism, uh, yeah. potentially along with the AUKUS arrangement that's just been announced? Right. Well, thanks, Matt. I'll tell you, that's exactly the reason I wrote Battlegrounds, right? I, I have this <laughs> this theory that, that if we should be able to come together ar around uh, issues of foreign policy and national security, right? I mean, it shouldn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican uh, be, uh, be, uh, on, in the way that you regard the you know the aggression of the Chinese Communist Party and the threat, or or Russian subversion, or uh, North Korea that could the only hereditary communist dictatorship in the world that is and, and one that is pursuing the most destructive weapons on earth right we should be able to to come together around these 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 uh these international challenges and there is a very high degree of of bipartisan support i'm worried a little bit now you know that that the biden administration might be getting a little bit weak on in the knees on this because you hear the rhetoric of cooperation and engagement creeping back in and you know there are constituencies in the united states that that push for that that are they're still operating under the fundamentally a flawed assumption that China, having been welcomed into the international order, it would play by the rules. And as a prosper, it would liberalize its economy and then and then liberalize its form of governance. And I think, of course, this neglected the degree to which emotion and ideology drives and constrains Chinese Communist Party leadership. But we endeavored from the very beginning as we were framing the China strategy. This is in is March of 2017. We engaged with leaders on, on Capitol Hill and our legislature to hear their ideas, to listen to them as we were framing the policy and strategy. And we did the same with our allies and partners, especially in the Quint Forum. Uh, when I was national security advisor in my first week, I think it was a few days after I took over, I met by video conference uh, the, my, my counterparts in the UK. Uh, it was Mark Sedwell, or soon after that, Mark uh, took over that job. Uh, Philippe Etienne in, in France, Mariangela Zappia in in uh, in Italy, and Christoph Huysken in Germany, and and we ju I just listened to them. Really, I was the new the new member of that team, and said, you know, what are your largest concerns? And China was among the top five. One of the things that we did, I think, was 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 a, a good way to affect multinational cooperation among like-minded partners. Is each one of us took one of those top five challenges and led a framing effort from a multinational perspective, keeping in mind each of our countries' relative advantages and competitive advantages and how they might be brought to bear uh, on that particular challenge. So, in, in many ways, you know, multinational cooperation, especially you know with with that group, uh, NATO more broadly, and especially you know Japan and and um, and and uh, and and allies and partners, Australia, obviously, you know, across uh, the Indo-Pacific region, 
you know, we, we frame this not just from a bipartisan perspective, but from a multinational perspective. And if, if anybody didn't see, I think it was uh, January of, the, of this past year, the Indo-Pacific strategy that was declassified by the Trump administration on its way out. It's, it's worth taking a look at. It's, it's available on the Internet. And, and line of effort one was multinational cooperation. Right. And and um, and I think that's carried through uh, th through both administrations. You know, you had the first summit of the quad format, which is the, the U.S., uh, Japan, uh, Australia and India. Um, and you, you have the AUKUS, as you mentioned. Uh, I, I think the trends are in the right direction. And, you know, I think the world's realizing it. I mean, that that that, that China poses a threat. I mean, I think we ought to send Xi Jinping flowers in a box of chocolates and say thank you. You know, for helping us realize that we have a common problem here that we have to work on together. All right. Um, thank you for this answer. Now, um, there are some hands still. I just wanted to jump in, if possible, if I may, given my chairing powers. Uh, because you were mentioning NATO and you were mentioning AUKUS and all that and the various uh, interaction between US, Europe and uh, the Pacific. So I was just wondering with, with regards to the latest event uh, such as AUKUS, the increased cooperation between the US, uh, the UK and Australia in this specific case or the Quad if you include Japan and India um, and European allies which on the one hand are required and requested usually by the US to do their fair share of the burden and all that when it comes to NATO burden sharing. And yet, uh, when it came to AUKUS, there was a strong reaction in France because it was it felt almost betrayed uh, other than for economic reasons, for the fact that it seemed that France was the, the European power which has, with, together with the UK, the strongest presence in Southeast Asia and consequently or in the Indo-Pacific in general. And so it seemed almost that the this agreement by excluding france went in the direction of blocking european efforts to contribute to security or a common vision for the indo-pacific so just wanted to hear your thoughts whether there are misunderstandings there or whether uh the the way that the us sees nato and uh, the european allies is different from the way that the europeans see themselves in regards to uh strategy specifically vis-a-vis -vis china yeah. Well, and there are going to be differences within Europe also, right? So there are always going to be differences within within alliances. But I think if you just look at the facts, right? Look at the fact that China has has destroyed these ecosystems in the South China Sea to build these weaponized islands and then has just given really uh instructions to their to their coast guard to shoot at any vessels that don't acknowledge what would be the la the largest land grab, so to speak, in history. Uh, in an area across which one third of the world's surface trade flows. And if you're Australia looking at that problem, you think, wow, I really need a defense capability to deter Chinese aggression uh, and to ensure the, the viability of my of my of my country based on on its dependence on on shipping and 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 freedom of navigation across that body of water. To do that, you need nuclear submarines. You know, you you can't you can't use uh, you can't use traditionally powered submarines because they don't have the range. You have to you have to expose yourself uh, too often and can't cover those distances. So I think what started this is a is a practical military problem, and then I think all of our alliances we should regard as not exclusive, right? Because you have AUKUS doesn't mean NATO is not important. Because you're working diplomatically through a quad format uh, doesn't mean your relationship with uh, you know with Vietnam or the Philippines is no longer uh, or the ASEAN countries broadly is no longer important. In fact, working together through these arrangements ought to be thought of as kind of almost a hub and spoke series of, of, of relationships where, you know, you, you can use each other's good relations with other countries to advance your common interests, preserve peace and, and promote prosperity. So, and to work on the problems that we know are global in nature and, and, and don't adhere to, to particular boundaries. So I don't, I don't think, I don't, I don't think this is a short-term problem with France, but I, I would, I would say that for, our French allies, who you know, who are our longest allies, and the country without whom we probably would not have gained our independence. Uh, I, I would, I would say that if you want to talk and use the language of of strategic autonomy in a way that suggests moral equivalence between the United States and and Russia or the United States and China, then hey, this is this may you're going to probably get more of these kind of arrangements, right? So I, I would say to to President Macron, who I I know and respect, you know, I would just say, hey. Uh, how about lightening up on the old strategic autonomy talk, <laughs> and, and let's get back to to strengthening the transatlantic alliance 
uh, based on on the threats that we see, uh, and and of course, always grounded in our in our common principles, right? That 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 should, that bind us together in, in, a, in a profound way. But it has to be about what we do together, right? I mean, I I've heard the Biden administration, and I applaud you know the emphasis on on our, our European allies and strengthening relationships. But it, that those relationships have to be a lot more than a better atmosphere at cocktail parties, you know, in Berlin and Paris, right? It has to be about working together on the challenges we face and on concrete outcomes. You know, like, like for example, you know, common agreement on, on, on um, internet privacy standards, right? We should be able to work on that or, or rules for digital commerce in a way that, that, is, that assures free and, and open uh, co competition. Uh, cooperation on development of, of sensitive technologies and critical technologies to the emerging data-driven global economy and advanced manufacturing and making supply chains more resilient, such as we've seen in, in semiconductors, right? I mean, the, the so-called T10 idea, of, right, where the cooperation between uh, between like-minded liberal democracies on on technology. Let's move all that forward, and that's how we ought to evaluate our relationship. I think is what are we getting done? All right. Thank you for the answer. Uh, and I'm going to give the floor to Clara and apologize for taking for cutting the line. Clara, we can't hear you right now. So oh, it might be muted. It says that I'm unmuted. Now I can hear you. Okay, good. I guess the connection is a bit so-so. Um, so <clears throat> perhaps it's more of a theoretical question. If I understood you correctly, sir, in the beginning, you said that you can't really enter a war without aiming to win the war. Um, but perhaps, for example, with relation to Afghanistan, uh, where different countries from the Soviet Union to the United States with its allies um, haven't really been able to win the war. Um, so with regards to Afghanistan, was it perhaps the wrong ambition from the beginning to attempt to win? Could it be that not all wars are possible to win? That's my yeah. question. Yeah, I think, well, I think you're right to point out that, right, there are limitations on what you can control. But I do think in Afghanistan, it, if you define first, what does is, what is winning mean? Winning means, I think, ensuring that you defeated the Taliban, drove the Taliban out of power because they're the ones who, who gave safe haven and support base to those who conducted the most destructive terrorist attack in history, taking nearly 3,000 lives uh, on September 11, 2001. Uh, and then, and then, and then uh, you're know, decimating uh, Al Qaeda, ensuring that Al Qaeda did not have, again, uh, the, the capability to conduct you know, terrorist attacks on, on that scale. But then really to achieve an enduring outcome, uh, th then you had to consolidate gains and get to a, a situation in which you know, the, the Taliban could not retake power, right? And that, and that what you would have in Afghanistan is a government that was hostile to jihadist terrorists uh, and was strong enough right, to withstand the, re the regenerative capacity of the Taliban. I do think that was feasible. And and uh, and I think we had actually already achieved it, but just not admitted it to ourselves that we had achieved it. We achieved it in an ugly way, in a way that was too wasteful. I mean, the uh, the, the the chapter in the book is entitled a you know a, a twenty year war, uh, you know, one year war fought twenty times over, and and we had inconsistent and fundamentally flawed strategies. And those strategies in Afghanistan were based on, you know, were were based on really the enemy we would prefer to fight rather than the actual enemy we were fighting. And, and a whole range of, of delusional uh, assumptions. So uh, in terms of Afghanistan as like kind of the graveyard of empires, uh, as a historian, I, I kind of, I reject that analogy, right? Because each war is different. Uh, the United States was not in Afghanistan, you know, for imperial aims, right? We weren't getting anything out of Afghanistan uh, except support uh, for the transformation in Afghan society that allowed them to escape the hell of Taliban rule from 96 to 2001 uh, and support for a government that, that would remain in power that were that would that would uh and remain hostile to uh uh to jihadist terrorists. I think that was achieved. You know, it was a, and it was all, it was already won and then we talked ourselves uh in, into self-defeat. All right. Um so and I just want to say, yes, I'll just, I'll just say one more question because I, I think what's really important is if our objective was just to leave Afghanistan because we thought it was no longer, you know, uh, no no longer uh, a mission that was attainable, why didn't we just leave? What what is astonishing to me is the degree to which we actually strengthened the Taliban and advocated for the Taliban on our way out 
and weaken the Afghan government security forces. And so I think the, the real folly of this is in the conduct of the war over the 20 years in, in a way that was inconsistent uh, and, and undermined our, our own efforts and was based on self-delusion. But the, but the, the end of the war, you know, from 2020, February of 2020, through this, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the horrible scenes we saw in Kabul at the end, uh, I think was, was an astounding uh, episode in, in strategic narcissism uh, and self-delusion. And, um, and, and, and uh, yeah, I think almost, a, an unprecedented in terms of us history example of strategic incompetence. Oh, that's uh, a lot to take a lot to think about. Okay. So two questions there. Uh, first, uh, the mic goes to Andy Laurie. Uh, thanks, Giuseppe. Thank you so much for joining us today, General. Really fascinating to hear from you. Having read a bit about uh, your views, I wonder if it, I could briefly ask you to share with us a few of your thoughts about the lessons that we can learn in life from from rugby, which I know is a passion of yours. Many thanks. <laughs> hey, I think there's so many lessons, so many lessons. Hey, first of all, there's a position for everybody. Well, maybe not anymore because even the biggest people are super fast now, but... <laughs> You know, but but I, I think that we everybody can contribute, and the thing is to put the you know put people in, in the right roles in organizations, and to recognize the value that anybody brings to your team, right? So you can have you can have a wing like me, but even a wing that plays like a forward, like I did, and then you can have you know a, a prop and a and a, a scrum half. I mean, you could I mean, so you, you can there's a role for everybody, and it's the way the team comes together that gives you the real power, you know, and. And then, and then I think there's there's so much you can accomplish without egos, right? With the, if if everybody is there to help the team succeed, help each other succeed, I think that rugby is the pure sport that do, that does that. I think that you can learn from rugby that you can't accomplish anything without some adversity and on occasion some pain, right? I mean, you know, there. I mean, I can't think of many things that are really great in life that don't come without some degree of self sacrifice, right? And so. I think that's a, that's an important uh, life lesson. I think it's also important to recognize that you can compete with others and do so in a civil way, right? And and uh, and you know the, the old saying that that uh, that rugby is a hooligan sport played by gentlemen, right? Played by gentlemen and gen gentle women because after after the after after the match, you know, you kind of leave whatever happened on the pitch aside, and uh, and you have a pint together and and um, and, and you and you celebrate your common humanity. And uh, and and your 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 common you know commitment to a sport that you both love right, which is part of your common humanity in that in that context. So I, I just think there's so much you can learn uh, from from rugby, and and I think if uh, you know if the world was more like rugby union, we'd be in a much better place. It might look violent, you know, but actually I think the world would be a lot less violent. <laughs> Thanks. Well, what's more. Uh, what's better to unite the two shores of the Atlantic than uh, an American talking about rugby? So our next question from uh, Simon King. Which we can't hear right now because you are muted. Or the moment still muted. I'm sorry, is that all right? Yes. 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 Uh, thank you, General. I'd like to ask about the logic of building up the Afghan National Army. In 2020, the British Army stood at 140,000, whereas the ANA stood at 180,000, 30% larger. But for the same period, the uh, Afghan gross uh, national product stood at uh, around 19 billion, whereas the British economy stood at 2.85 trillion which means that the Afghan state was supporting a, an army 30% larger than ours on an economy which was 0 0.7 the size. I wonder what the logic of that policy decision was. Well, the logic is it wasn't the Afghans who were supporting it. It was the international community, right, and, and our coalition. It was, and so, I, you know, I, I think that the, 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 uh, what we were buying with that was an insurance policy essentially to prevent from happening what is happening now and actually what will, will cost much more uh, due to the collapse of the Afghan state and just coping uh, and compensating for the humanitarian catastrophe that is just now beginning to unfold. 
uh, as well as the cost of the of the, the increased security threat and and the increased I would say political threat uh, based on the emboldening emboldenment of our, of our emboldening our our enemies. So it was a sustainable commitment, not by Afghan GDP, uh, but by Afghans being supported by the by an inter, a broader international effort. Now the the problem with the the, the fighting power of that army was was, was much greater than numbers. And the collapse of the of, of the military was based on, on a couple of factors. I mean, one was those psychological blows that I mentioned that we delivered. Uh, but the other was our inattention uh, to, to, the, to the strength of the institutions that would have to sustain that military. And in fact, what happened is our short-term mentality there actually contributed to a weakening of military institutions because we kept telling the Afghans, hey, we're leaving. Okay, now we're really leaving. And what, what Afghan leaders did is they started to hedge and they started to think, okay, well, what happens when the Americans leave? Well, civil war comes back. And they were thinking about the civil war from 92 to 96. And so various groups within Afghanistan were trying to build up their power base in advance of a post-US Afghanistan. And they did that through these criminalized patronage networks that captured state institutions and functions. And in many ways, were hollowing out those institutions as we were trying to build them because it was the weakness of those institutions, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Interior, that gave them impunity and essentially license to steal from the state and to divert aid to build up that power base. So this was this was a range of corrupt activity that was that was cancerous, that was eating away at the at the uh, at the Afghan state. And then, of course, we built forces th that were dependent on our support, which would be okay. If we, if we sustain that support in terms of intelligence collection and surveillance capabilities tied to our air power, but we pulled it out from them. We pulled it out from an organization that was actually uh, organized and, and trained and, and equipped right or wrong, you know, to be dependent on that capability. So, um, yeah, it was, I mean, we were, we were sustaining a much larger force than, than Afghanistan could have sustained on its own. But, but who was sustaining the, the Taliban? Al-Qaeda? Pakistan, Pakistan funneling donations that came out of out of Gulf states, maybe not state sponsored, but out, out of Gulf donors, uh, and then also Russia and Iran were providing support to the to the Taliban. Giuseppe, we can't hear you. I'm telling My you guys, switch, switch to Zoom, switch to Zoom. Uh, you're Zoom. right, you're right. That's, <laughs> we're, we're ending. Uh, that's one of our announcements is that we are ending. We're about to return to in-person. Uh, before concluding, I think there was another hand up by Lydia again. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Thank you very much indeed. Um, General, I wonder if I could please ask you, um, was there sufficient consideration of the inter-ethnic, inter-tribal rivalries that um, were so crucial to the Afghan situation? I'm thinking, yeah. for example, of, of a, I'm afraid this is anecdotal evidence. I still think it's relevant. I knew um, a British Army military intelligence corps officer who served in Afghanistan who told me, an example that he thought really epitomized what went wrong with how the conflict was handled. Um, there were two tribes um, in two villages, A and B, and A went to the British and said, look at B, they're baddies, they're terrorists, they support the terrorists, they've got lots of weapons, they've got a cache of weapons. We're goodies, we, tribe A, village A, we're, um, we're supporters of a democracy. You should go over to Tribe B. You should, you know, rough them up, search them, you know, give them a hard time because because they like terrorists. We don't. We, we like uh, democracy. And really, it was the fact was that B had stolen some poppies from A a hundred years ago and no one seemed to know that this and, you know, all the little factors individually might be insignificant. But the, you know, the combined intelligence picture obviously matters. And I, I rather got the impression that um, people simply didn't understand the, not only some of some of the factors that you mentioned earlier in your lecture, um, of, uh, in terms of trying to understand other people's um, concerns on the ground, locals' concerns, which is an absolutely valid point, you know, and we shouldn't just talk about democracy and reflect that in other people's concerns, Afghans' concerns. But was there a sufficient consideration, do you think, of things like, inter-tribal and inter-ethnic conflict, I think in particular of the fact that I haven't really heard anyone mention the fact that the Taliban is predominantly a Pashtun 
um, group. And of course, there were Pashtun elements in the um, legitimate government, but nobody really seems to have been claiming to represent the Dari speaking community. Um, so I wonder what, what are your thoughts on all of that? Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, there there was insufficient attention given to it, and and what happened from the very beginning is is uh, is U.S. and coalition British forces empowered a lot of the wrong actors. I mean, I think in 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 uh, there's a great example in Kandahar with Golag Shirzai, for example, who was a really a criminal predator uh, during this during the civil war from ninety two to ninety six, and it was his predation that helped give rise to the Taliban. Because remember, the Taliban portrayed themselves as as kind of a law and order party that would come in and kind of and end you know sort of the you know the kidnapping and the extortion and the rape and so forth that were that attended the civil war and and of course the, the Taliban you know just imposed a new form of brutality and a new form of hell uh, but we by empowering Shurzai and others right what we did is we alienated other tribes and and we actually you know helped rekindle a degree of of support for for the Taliban and as you mentioned you know the the war in Afghanistan was in many ways an intra pushtun civil war but it was an interna- it was internationalized based on the ISI supporting the Taliban because Pakistan wants to dominate have the dominant voice in in in, in Afghanistan because it fears pushtun separatism pushtun nationalism two thirds of the pushtun population is in Pakistan and so Pakistan thinks if there is a Pashtun nationalist government in power that's friendly to Iran, they'll get surrounded by by India, and it'll be the first step in the dismantlement of, of Pakistan. And so it is a it was an intra Pashtun civil war with an international dimension. And then there are the there are the tensions between the other ethnic groups and the Mujahideen era militias associated with those groups, right? The Haradis uh, under Ismail Khan. You know, you had uh, you know Muhammad Adenor. Uh, as as the dominant figure in the in the in the Northern Alliance, especially uh, in in the in the far north of Mazar Sharif area, you have the Panshiris, who are sort of a different aspect of the of the Northern Alliance. But you know we we you're, we didn't pay enough attention to it, and so this is why I said we should have been talking to Afghans and had sort of an internal diplomatic effort that was invigorated, sustained over time, instead of going to da- Doha helping to create this Taliban political commission by, you know, by releasing these, some of these people from Guantanamo and making concessions to them. I, I think that was a, a huge, a huge mistake getting, getting, getting Mullah Baradar out of prison in Pakistan. So he could be the shop window, you know, for the Taliban. All that was a mistake. The other dynamic here is the from and we're playing very important role of gas kind of stitched together. Uh, and to focus on building our future all Afghans. We could have a lower, but instead what we did is we, we you know, we, we wanted to try to in this government. You know, we actually sided with some of who were opposed to him after just, and then what we did is we create conditions for even more fighting. You know, even more Sorry weakened. to interrupt you, um, General McMaster. We can't hear you very well anymore. I don't know why. Um, How about now? How about now? And now it's slightly better. We're still okay. cutting out. Like little green things are on the side of the door again. So, can I chime in with a question before you disappear altogether? Is it possible to imagine uh, security expenditure over a long period of time in a foreign intervention rather than looking at it as a time scale of war? In other words, the security aspect is uh, one that the country can afford, such as the United States. Yeah, it's possible. I think that's what we do, isn't it? I mean, I, I think that's what you do, is you look at your expenditures over time. When, when it was $122 billion a year in Afghanistan, that was not sustainable. When it was down to $22 billion a year, that was sustainable. And we should have looked for ways to, to get it 
to drop even lower by con- more contributions from others and so forth. But I do believe that by the end of the conflict, we were at a sustainable level of effort in Afghanistan and we were paying a price that was cheap relative to the cost now uh, of the collapse of the government and security forces and jihadist terrorists reestablishing the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. Thanks. Well, um, thank you, General. The, the we, we just got news that there are some weak connection problems in US ISPs, including Stanford. So there's a reason why you cut off for a little bit, but most of it, we got the rest. Um, I don't know if you want to try and give a short answer to the second half of the question that we missed, but uh, to the previous question, which was, if you remember think, what it was. Yes, go ahead. I, I think, General, uh, we heard you as far as you said we shouldn't have released everyone from prison. All that was a mistake. And at that point, there was a problem with the line, I think, and you got cut off. Um, if, if you'd be able to just con- conclude um, what you were saying earlier, your, your answer to my question. Gosh, I, I, I mean, um, so much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just think we delivered all these blows to the Afghan government. We forced the Afghan government to release. Uh, oh, actually, are you talking about the establishment of the Taliban Political Commission? And um, I was just talking about um, the, the Pashtun inter-ethnic conflict between the Taliban yeah. and the, uh, the yeah. legitimate government, etc. Yeah, I think we sp- should have spent less time talking to the Taliban in recent years and effort and more time talking to Afghans across tribal and ethnic lines to act as mediators uh, between these groups, we being the international community, right? Those who have the strongest relationships to help Afghans come together around a vision for the future of the country uh, that was you know, anti-Taliban, right? And, and pro-humanity uh, and pro-Afghan. So I, I think that uh, that was the missed opportunity. All right, now we got that part. Uh, whole thing so clearly that was shareable. Um, we are concluding. So the last thing I wanted to do is, uh, before thanking the general and allowing him to go ahead with his busy day, uh, there's another question from the chat, which uh, is again from Andy, and I agree with. So I wanted to just ask um, if you have any one sentence or one minute tips for junior scholars seeking to influence the policy debate, just like you having bridged the gap between academia and policy multiple times. So just yeah. one tip for us young scholars who want to do yeah. something similar, maybe at a lower scale. Well, I think I think study these policy issues the way that Sir Michael Howard, who was a founder of this group and is someone who I admire tremendously, would suggest, right? To study in width, depth, and context, right? To, to be able to see these issues in the, in the broad sweep of time, to understand both continuity and change, to, to look at each of these issues and, and problems and experiences in depth. So as Michael Howard said, the tidy lines of history dissolve and you understand the complex causality of events. And then in context, right? In context of, of, of social dynamics, of our democratic forms of governments, government, and what we've been talking about in large measure, which is our ability to sustain our will for, uh, for protracted commitments. So I think you can't go wrong with width, depth, and context. Well, on that pill of wisdom, uh, I would like to virtually applaud General McMaster and thank him for being with us, for sharing his knowledge about the insights of how Washington works, but also on the long-term issues that affect not just the United States, but the whole world. In uh, conclusion, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, next week we are not going to have our usual event, but we're going to have a social event at the Oxford retreat. If the journal wants to take an airplane and join us, is more than welcome to do so. We will be at the Oxford retreat from 4 to 8 p.m. So please do join us at any point. It will be lovely to see many of you after more than a year without being able to see each other. And then in week three, so two weeks from now, we're going to have our first in-person event of the year, which is going to be by Captain Chris Connolly, former uh, British Naval and Defense Attaché to Moscow. It's going to talk about Russia and its armed forces. Have you for, from the British Embassy? So we talk about China today. We're going to talk about Russia next time. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you again, General McMaster. Thank you, everyone. We can Thanks, conclude man. our live stream and we look forward to see you again. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.